Welcome to the Success Story Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Clary. On this podcast, I have candid interviews with execs, celebrities, politicians, and other notable figures, all who have achieved success through both wins and losses, to learn more about their life, their ideas, and their insights. I sit down with leaders and mentors and unpack their story to help pass those lessons on to others through both experiences and tactical strategy for business professionals, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. Without further ado, another episode of the Success Story Podcast. Thanks again for joining me today. I am sitting down with Chris Hart Vixen, who is the founder and CEO of Dooley. Uh, now, Chris has a 20 plus year career in sales, having worked in a variety of roles. Um, but most notably, uh, he has worked as uh, several senior, le- senior level leadership positions. So uh, SVP, uh, EVP, and most uh, recently, uh, EVP sales. Um, he's also worked as uh, several sales leaders, directors, vice presidents across other organizations. Um, but what I wanted to speak to Chris about, why I'm excited uh, that he's on, is he has a strong opinion on uh, what, you know, the, what, what sales looks like now in terms of sales within large SaaS organizations, uh, the problems that these organizations have, as well as he has the scope of experience from working uh, as an executive at a high level, uh, scaling sales at Vision Critical from zero, well, from not zero dollars, but from you know low six figures, all the way through to over 100 million. Um, so he has that entire scope of working with an organization, scaling a commercial organization, working across all these different roles. So he has a very much boots on the ground view of the problems that exist within companies as they grow and they scale. And that's really what led him to build out Dooley. Um, so, you know, thanks again for joining me, Chris. I appreciate you sitting down. Um, uh, I want to, I want to understand your story, uh, your career, and then let's speak about um, what you're doing now. Okay. Uh, so we can go way back. Um, yeah, let's do it. I, I think that when you look at an entrepreneur, there's, there are a couple of really important traits. Um, and I think, I think I possess some of them. I think you have to have a real big curiosity for, uh, exploring a pain or a problem and, and really digging into it. Uh, but it usually starts a lot younger in your, in your career. You know, you either get the buzz off of the, the lemonade stand that you started as a kid or you don't. And, and then you sort of build from there. So when I was in uni, I actually, uh, had my first quote unquote startup where I imported sweaters from Ecuador uh, and brought them back in hockey bags and sold them for mass profit and used that to pay for a lot of my education in my fourth year. And just started seeing this really interesting opportunity to be your own boss. Um, when, I, when I graduated university, I was convinced I was gonna be an advertising executive. I wanted to be a creative director, I wanted to live in New York, I wanted to do basically uh, a modern day version of Mad Men without all of the misogyny. Um, And uh, I graduated in the mid nineties and I was super into tech. Tech was really just starting to come into its own and I got a job in tech and I kind of just ran with it. And um, my passion started to build around certain aspects of technology. I was working in corporate sales for you know, hardware sales. Um, and back then we used to have global uh, trade shows called Comdex where, you know, you'd have these big computer expositions around North America and around the world. Uh, I was actually in multimedia design school at the time while I was working and learning how to be an animator, learning how to do post-production work, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I knew like exactly the kind of technology I'd want to have in my own dream system for doing that kind of work. And when Comdex was in Vancouver, I got uh, the opportunity to meet these people from this company in Montreal called Matrox. And they were blown away by my knowledge of their product. They're like, man, you know more about our product than we do. Why don't you come work for us? I'm like, "Hmm, okay, I've never lived in Montreal before. So I moved to Montreal and uh, and started working like deeper into tech and started really digging into hardware. And we took Matrox to a billion dollars in annual recurring revenue. only to have this little company called NVIDIA pop out of nowhere and really start to take the market on, right? So uh, NVIDIA became the dominant player in in graphics technology. I moved back to Vancouver and started my career as an entrepreneur. That's sort of the beginning of the runway for me. Um, When I was in Montreal, we were like 
crushing, absolutely crushing our number uh, relative to the rest of the world. Um, I ran all of Canada um, at the time. And when I came back, I, was, I ran a, a distributorship that basically sold high-end technology to uh, medical imaging companies and all sorts of stuff. We sold that to Bell, Micro Pro, uh, Bell Micro Products in uh, the early 2000s. Uh, nice little exit. And that's started to get me more involved in SaaS. What I realized in my career is that I, I was really good at sales, probably because I didn't think like a salesperson. I thought about people. I thought about empathy. I thought about the challenges that other people would have first rather than thinking about how I could push a product onto them. Um, but I was also horrible, horrible at uh, being compliant with systems that were put in place because I hated administrative work. You know, I was not, uh, I, I think the funny thing is if, if you asked a salesperson, you know, about like their job description, nobody would ever say uh, that they had to spend a lot of time filing information, right? And if you said that during the interview, it's like, hey, got this great gig for you in sales. We're going to, gonna, your territory is going to be the Pacific Northwest and you're going to sell to companies like Microsoft and Intel and all these different companies. And by the way, the best part of your job, filing. You're going to love it. Um, and, and so when you're tripling your number, and I was, I was tripling my number uh, at Vision Critical when, uh, when I started there and, and into my career as was a journey around the world with them. Nobody ever stops to say, hey, you just signed Major League Baseball, but did you enter the competitive field in Salesforce? So I started to look at that challenge and wanted to take it on with a little bit more rigor when I left Vision Critical um, and figure out a way, again, going back to that whole empathy story and, and digging into the problem, wanted to figure out a way that salespeople could spend their time doing the things that would actually help them earn their paycheck as opposed to the things that helped keep the business informed. I figured there was probably a better way to do both. So that was the genesis. And, and I guess that's a, just such an uh, impactful point for somebody who's worked in sales, like the non-sales activities just kill, like absolutely kill your day. It just takes away. And it's like the, and, and it's also, I don't, I don't even know if you ever want to go into this, but it's also a personality thing. Like there are, there are intrinsic personalities that are, are, are less, um, if you ever run like a disc profile on anybody or anything like that, like the, the personalities are, are less apt to want to do that kind of work and salespeople traditionally aren't. So this is a huge pain point that you're solving. Yeah. So, so you, you understand the pain point, you've lived through it, and that's usually what makes the best entrepreneur, right? It's somebody who is actually, uh, who's actually lived through this problem and then they want to go solve it. But how do, you, how do you start? How do you start this company? Um, coming, you know, uh, you've had some success in the past. Mm -hmm. what, what is the first steps you've taken to create Dually? Because this is not, you've had success, but you've never had success in this realm in particular in SaaS to this. Yeah. Example. Yeah. And, and look, I've, I've been a part of failures before too. So uh, I, I glanced over a, a couple of parts of my career where things didn't go quite the way you expected them to, but they still went okay. Cause you learn lessons from all of those different things. I became, I became really fascinated with workflow and, and trying to optimize workflow primarily because I hated doing all of the things that I felt other things could do for me. Um, and, and so the start point for me was just digging in and doing the research, right? You got to figure out if the problem is you or if the problem is universal. And, and there's a massive difference between that. If you want to build a product for yourself, that's a pretty small market. Um, so you go through the traditional stuff, right? Like, I mean, Steve Blank talks about this stuff all the time. Get out and get out, uh, get out of the office, get out of the building and, and talk to, uh, customers, talk to prospects. But you really do need to figure out, like, is this a repeated pattern that you're going to see elsewhere? So a lot of, a lot of research goes into that to, to understand, you know, how big the market is, how big the problem is, because if the problem is, is small and the market is big, it doesn't really matter. People aren't going to try to solve it. Um, and it turns out the problem is really big because data gets really old really fast and sits in the wrong spots. Um, and there's all sorts of things that the remnants that, that happen as a result of that problem too. And, and that was the cool part for me was as we started to dig into the problem, it was clear that there was actually a second problem, which was probably as big, if not bigger than the first problem. It was one that most people didn't really understand. And that's, you have, you have a sales organization that, or even like the organization in general that is there to support the salesperson and, and try to help to, expedite sales. We always talk about like customer acquisition costs and like the time to close and all of those different things. 
the organization is there as a support mechanism. In the old days, the good old days, the salesperson was off on their own and it's like, here's your bag, go and sell. Right now the organization supports. But the reality is they didn't know when to support or how to support because again, the data isn't coming across. So what, what was happening was, uh, and I saw this myself, you'd go and talk to the salespeople, have your one-on-ones with them as a sales leader or sales manager, and they'd be talking about their deals and you'd be whiteboarding stuff. And you'd be looking at the deal and going, oh yeah, I didn't know about that, I didn't know about that. I wish you told me about that earlier. I wish I knew about this. Um, and because you just told me about that, did you know we have this really great case study or this really helpful white paper? Or you should talk to uh, Susan because she just did a deal exactly like this. That information wasn't making its way back to the salesperson, which is enablement, right? An activation of information. And all of these content management systems that were out there were, they were, they were, purporting that they could help the salesperson be better at their job. Uh, giant file, like Salesforce, giant, giant filing cabinet. Content management system, another giant filing cabinet. What did we do? We threw them up in the cloud and then thought people would work with them. Uh, the content management system was supposed to be activated by Salesforce or by the CRM in general. And because nobody was updating anything in the CRM, the content management system was just this place where content went to die. Right, so the traditional model wasn't working well. Again, data wasn't moving. So the premise that we started with, which was let's help salespeople get rid of a super big pain and update Salesforce automatically for them, turned into this brokering of information between the salesperson and the rest of the organization so the salesperson could be smarter in moments of truth as well as uh, having the business have the information that they needed to do their job. And, and help me, circles, get tighter and tighter. It makes a lot of sense. Now help me understand as, as you, I want to just understand how that, like the lessons learned at, um, at vision critical. So mm-hmm. as you grew vision critical from, I don't know what your starting point was when you joined the company, but oh, it was not right. six figures at best. Okay. So that's very low. Yeah. <laughs> so as you join a company at that stage, you basically were on board for, almost the, the full life cycle of what somebody can experience at a company through the different stages yeah. of growth. Yeah. So what do you see at all those stages? What are the nuances of growing a business from that six figure mark to a hundred million? And how yeah. does that, the, like the trouble that the, that the founders see when they hire those extra people or they have those extra deals or the processes or I, I'd love to know all of that. That's a lot of, a lot of different cycles in a business. For sure. And I think that at every inflection point, you're like, damn it, how are we going to grow this and double it again? And it always seems like this insurmountable job, right? You're like, oh, we've already got all the low hanging fruit. There can't possibly be more low hanging fruit. Um, But that is usually not the case. It's usually never the case. Um, And and so I think that part part of actually growing with a company like that is also understanding the art of the possible. Uh, we walked into a market at Vision Critical, and in the very early days, we were, were selling. They were trying to sell the the business, or they were trying to sell the product, with market researchers being the salespeople and market research organizations being their distribution channel. And my very quick observation there in the early days was, why the hell would they do that? And the CEO, who came from market research background, goes, "What do you mean?" I go. So a market research agency makes their money with consulting revenue. And what you're saying is that by putting in the the vision critical platform, you don't need to do as many projects. You don't need to spend as much on research. So now you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And so the person, the company that's getting rich is vision critical. And the company that is maybe not seeing the advantage is the research agency. So why the heck would they ever lead with you? They're always going to say in their back pocket, they've got this thing, but they're never going to lead with it. So changing the distribution model was probably the first aha moment. And that's actually how I ended up starting at Vision Critical because I was in talking to them about what I thought was flawed in their model. And as soon as we did that, it took about six months to, to really figure out the narrative and the story of going direct to the, uh, the buyer. Um, and I remember like, the, the first, first time that this happened, and I remember the CEO coming in and basically doubting that, I w- that we're doing the right thing because it was taking a while to figure it out. Uh, and I, I like that. I actually really like it when people doubt it because it gives you a villain and you need to have a villain. In sales, you need to have a villain. Um, and my villain was disbelief. And, and so I was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. 
and I, and that's the most exciting thing is to pr is to prove people wrong and, and to kind of challenge the the status quo. That's really how tech companies get started is by disrupting and challenging the status quo. So as a good Canadian, uh, I went and said, we're going to sign the National Hockey League. And we did. We got the NHL. It was one of our first paid customers that we were actually allowed to show the logo for. And you walk in, and again, Canadian company, you walk into the room and you're like, everybody, here's the contract that we just signed with the National Hockey League. And everybody's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> it was like this huge moment. But it was also like, it was a moment of relief, but it was also a moment of belief. Because you knew that if you could get the NHL, you'd get all the other leagues. And you knew that if you got one magazine, you would get all the magazines and you would get all the retailers if you got the gap and so on, right? So that was like the early learning is that the art of the possible would allow you to scale it and the art of the narrative uh, would help you to scale it faster. So uh, <laughs> I remember saying this in, when I was in France once, I used to live in the UK with Vision Critical as well. And I sat down in front of the sales team that I was in charge of in France and I said, you need to understand the more you sell, the more you sell, right? It's just this beautiful snowball effect. So you create momentum in a market. The, the other thing that was really interesting for us early on is I think we created a new energy in an old space. And, and for me, that's, I think that's a fundamental thing that you need to try to do when you walk into a, a, a space that's fairly traditional or, or has been the same way for a long time. So if you look uh, if I sort of draw it forward from my, my time at, at BC to where I am now, one thing that we really try to do is bring new energy to something that was really almost complacently uh, aligned to enterprise tech has to look a certain way and feel a certain way and really challenge that. And, and as you grow um, and as you found that, uh, not say product market fit, but I guess best best way to take that product to market and yeah, market and model fit. Mar yeah. That market model fit is the best. That's a really good way of putting it. As you found that you started to scale. What are some of the problems that, that you started to see as the company grew exponentially? Uh, some of the problems were some people wanted to hold on to a certain way and some people were, were ready to let go and try something even more aggressive. Um, and, and, you know, when, whenever you have a blip, like you're, and you're always going to have a blip because, at some point you promote Chris out of sales and you put him into a leadership role. Well, Chris was doing really well in sales. Now you got somebody else that has to ramp into a role. And so there's that awkward sort of, mm -hmm. you know, the messy middle, uh, if you will, that happens. Um, and uh, some people don't have patience for that. Again, it, it kind of goes back to what the role and it took six months to kind of get the wheels rolling. Well, then you have to go through that cycle again with your next wave of, of salespeople uh, as they come in. So, uh, you get people that want to snap back to what was working in the very, very early days. And, and we'd already, that ship had sailed. So, you know, we had to, we had to do a really good job of, of trying not to um, run in the zigzag pattern. You want to try to run in straight lines as much as possible. It gets harder to do when there's more voices and more influencers involved in the, in the business to keep that alignment and that, that, uh, run in the same direction mentality. And that I, that I, I completely understand that point. What I actually meant with that question was more along the lines of, uh, scalability issues, more in terms of actually like incorporating software enablement tech to actually help with some of the scalability issues and, and the issues that actually, let me say this. Are there, are there process problems at, six figures that are just just sort of taken to another level or magnified at yeah yeah, at yeah. 50 million and that's what i'm saying that's what i was yeah. trying to get out like what are those process problems and and how should you should you target them or tackle them right away or is it something that you only see come up in a business once they get past a certain uh threshold yeah, oh, I think you got to try to capture the, the, as much of it as, as possible in the early days. So what you'll notice in terms of process and, and problems, and I was sort of alluding to it when I said, you know, you promote me into a different role and suddenly I'm not selling anymore. Part of the problem with me not selling anymore is that all my tribal knowledge traveled with me uh, unless we had a document somewhere. So one of the biggest problems that we had was conveying that tribal knowledge to the next generation of sellers. 
uh, and making sure that everybody had this built out playbook. Now, I want you to rewind the clock a little bit. When, when I was at BC, I started in 2005. Most enablement tech, like sales enablement wasn't even a thing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, product marketing was barely even a thing. So we were largely uh, making it up as we, as we went along. And the way that you convey knowledge to everybody was at your annual sales kickoff. Once a year, you would share knowledge, which is like, it, it's almost disastrous to the business to wait that long. So we, you know, I, I learned from that and really held on to that lesson of the importance of immediacy in sharing information and the importance of trying to help people to shape a story into their own words. I could tell you stories about how the National Hockey League changed the rules in the game based on the, the research that was done in, in their community. I could tell you stories about how Major League Baseball selected the American, Team America uniforms for the, the Olympics based on information from the research. Nobody else could tell you that unless I told them that, right? And then they got to put it in their own words. Uh, the other thing that I learned is that when at scale, there are so many stories flying around, right? Uh, because you got so many deals and there, some of those stories are more specific to different verticals than others. But the, the gatekeepers for those stories were typically the post sales people, the customer success and implementation folks. They knew every ROI story. They knew every uh, reason why a customer loved us or hated us. Getting that information from them was actually really hard, mm-hmm. right? And, and as you start your own company and, you know, in the early days at BC, or sorry, at Dooley, I was really responsible for both sides. I still am to a, obviously to a degree, to degree but um, the, the, the post-sale stories become the, the launch pad for your next sales. You got to get that information into people's hands. If you don't, you will bottleneck and you will choke out for a period of time while people build their own narratives. And it's like, why would you want to reinvent the wheel every single time new people come in? Now, I have, I have a question for you as a CEO of a company now. And you've, yeah. seen, you've seen how a lack of tribal knowledge can hurt an organization. Now, a CEO, a CEO has an extra responsibility because not only does that CEO have to pass on the knowledge and the playbook that they've used to, to really build out their initial iteration of a product or whatnot, but they also have to pass on that evangelism and, and the love for the brand. Now, some may say that it's impossible for, for an employee to ever love a brand as much of it as a CEO. Um, but what would, do you agree with that or do you disagree? And you, can, and you as a CEO have now found a way to pass on your, your passion, your evangelism for Dooley to your employees along with the playbook. I think that you have to. Uh, so when I look for people to, to join the business, I do look for people that have natural curiosity that like to solve big problems. And frankly, people that get what we do and why it's important. Um, and, and so I think if you start with a basic building block of, I totally get what you're doing at, at Dooley when you hire people, when they come on board, you can build that, that passion and that, that, desire to win but it, it is it's a mentality uh, as much as anything else and people either have the mentality or they don't you can try to build infectiousness through culture and through but again that's that's part of good hires too right you hire really good people who are really passionate and who are, get aligned on a mission and the job is half done now as a leader there are incremental things that you need to do if you can't sell your own product please don't expect somebody else to do it ever. Right. Hey, Hey hey, guys, we've built this awesome thing. I've never been able to sell it myself, but I'd sure love for you to do it. Good luck. Right. That's, that's not infectious. But if you can say, you know what, last week I went out and I, I took my spear with me and I did some hunting and I brought in this and this is, this is the story behind it. These are the critical milestones. This is why it was great. Those things are really important. Um, it's like passion and enthusiasm is also a momentum game, right? So the more momentum that you have, the easier it is for people to feel passionate about it. If you are on a slow ebb, it can start to feel like a job. You don't want it to feel like a job. You want people to come to work going, today we are going to slay dragons. And is that, and, and that, that culture, obviously you understand the importance of it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, is there, is there, uh, cause I, I appreciate that you understand the importance of it as a CEO. I think that's very, I think that's, that's something to, uh, to, you know, pat yourself on the back of it because I don't think every CEO understands that, but I would also ask you as somebody hiring for jobs, how do you make sure that, a CEO has the right mindset is framed the way you are, because I think the way you understand how to grow business, how you understand culture, you understand how to hire people. That's the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. But how do you, as a, as a, as a employee, as somebody who's being hired as a hiree, I don't know if that's a proper word, but as a hiree or whatever that person is called, how do you, how do you gauge an organization's effectiveness to, to build that culture for you? Uh, I would ask the the person I'm, that's interviewing me a bunch yeah. of questions around that as well. Tell me your journey here, right? So you may, I mean, in the early days, you're going to be interviewed by the CEO. In the yeah. later days, the CEO is probably not going to have much to do with the interviewing process unless they're hiring for the executive suite. Um, unfortunately, I'd love to be able to sit down and talk to every single person that, that came in uh, and tell them why I believe in it. Uh, and usually what ends up happening now is, uh, when, or when the company gets bigger, you do a cohort of people at the same time where you bring them all into a room and you say, look, this is the story. This is the journey. This is why I'm so excited to have you on board to be a, a participant in the journey with us or a member of the journey with us. Um, so I, I think that as, as in a prospective employee, the, the questions that you want to ask are around why did you join? How, you know, how is, you know, you, you say you join for these reasons how has it lived up to that Yeah, for you? I think, I think how, are you how are you capturing that magic? How are you capturing the lightning in the bottle? Yeah. And you no. can see it. Like you yeah. can see, I remember going down to visit one of my, uh, my partners uh, in the, the States about a year and a half, maybe two years ago. And you could feel the energy in their office. And I just, I looked at my co-founder and I said, man, this is awesome. This feels good. Like, what a great place for these people to work. You can just like, you can just feel the surge, like, like this, almost like there was like this invisible nightclub that was happening in there where there's just this, this going through the office. Right. And, and it just, it stuck with me. It's like, man, we got to build like that. Um, now uh, there's, there's one point here that when I was introducing you, I said, uh, I want to talk about you scaling a startup from 2 million uh, and growing at 300% year over year. I didn't have the name of that startup. Is that Dooley? Is that the startup? <laughs> is that what, is that <laughs> yeah, that, I, that I think the message is that is the, that's the story from really like in terms of the funding that we've taken on and, and where we are, that's definitely Dooley. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. So, so talk to me about, I guess, you know, we've spoken about um, Vision Critical. Are mm-hmm. there any other, I guess, Fun, fun stories, and I, I say fun as a as a reference point, but it, it's like you know any any trials, tribulations, lessons learned through growing duly and and now growing it you know three hundred percent year over year. I don't know what your ARR is, and I don't know if you want to say it, but that's yeah. fine. But uh, you're you're obviously it's it's a success. Um, so walk me through some of the lessons learned, even though you had the career and you were you know EVP is pretty much upper echelons of. A uh, hundred million is like, that's, that's pretty much, you know, where you can be in terms of sales leadership. I think you can say quite uh, assertively that you've, you've been in that role. So now you start from scratch and what yeah, you, you learn. You, you uh, go yeah. from caviar to ramen, right? Yeah, exactly. So what are, what are the lessons learned um, building out Dooley? Uh, so a couple things come to mind. First of all, you, you need a lot of focus, right? You need to, again, you need to run in straight lines. I alluded to it before. There is a tendency in the early days of a business to become beholden to the needs of a customer as opposed to a market. And if you become beholden to a customer and you start building for that one customer, you might not be building. You might be building for the market. You might get lucky, but you really need to validate that stuff and make sure that that whatever you're building is being built for the masses or your product is and your business isn't going to scale as quickly as you would hope. Um, and so, you know, you want to make sure that even if you have loud voices in the room, because you have a big customer and a bunch of small ones that you don't just build for them, uh, it will, it will deviate your plan and it can create a lot of confusion. I would say the other thing along the lines of focus is just because you place a small bet in something and it doesn't pan out, doesn't necessarily mean that that small bet won't pan out down the road if you continue to bet on it. But you need, if you're going to continue to bet on something, 
you need to continue to research it and dig in and make sure that the, the initial bet was based on a problem that you knew and that the incremental investment was based on problems that were surrounding that. So, you know, there, there are a number of things that we built in the product that at first blush, that's like, nobody's using this. Ugh, why do we build this stupid thing? Um, but you knew there was an end game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's Stephen Covey 101, or I think it's chapter, uh, chapter one, which is begin with an end in mind. And, and so you do need to really think about that um, as you're building up anything in the product and in the roadmap. And again, making sure that you're building things for the right reasons. A couple of things that I think were important to me. I, I lean heavy on culture. Uh, you spend a lot of time in your day with the people uh, that you hire and that you have, have to go to the work with every single day. And I never, ever wanted to go and work at a company where I felt like I didn't feel like I was a part of the team or a part of the crew. Whether you're at the top of that uh, hiring structure or the bottom or anywhere in between, everybody has to feel aligned. But, and this is the important but, culture, if you focus solely on culture, you can still kill your business. You still need people that can execute lovely, wonderful people can come through the doors of your company that you're like, man, I really, really like this person so, so much. I really, really want to keep working with them. If they're not able to deliver, you still need to make hard decisions to, to part ways. And, and I think that that's a hard lesson for people to learn. I, there's always a fear that you'll never be able to hire the next person if you release the person that isn't necessarily performing to your, your uh, needs or, or able to deliver to your needs. So, uh, you know, they always say like, fail fast, fail fast at all parts of your business, right? Fail fast when it comes, if hire fast and, and fire faster, I, sure. Uh, but obviously for the right reasons, uh, and same thing in a product, like build quick and, and scrap it quicker if it, if it sucks. Uh, those are some really, really, really important lessons that you can learn in any business. Um, and two that I really hold on to. I would say, you know, if I were to look at any other uh, things that are really important, it's set the pace. You, you have to be the pace car, right? And that means that you're going to make some sacrifices in certain parts of your life. You know, being an entrepreneur means that you are probably spending a little bit less time with your kids. Probably means that you're focused a little bit more heavily on your work and your work family. And they, they do become a family. Um, and, and that part is you, you have to know if you have an appetite for it. Like I, I love, love, love my, my kids and I love, love, love my partner. Uh, and you know, it, it eats at me when I don't spend time with them. Uh, I always begin with the end in mind to recognize that, you know, there is an end game for this, which is, you know, a level of comfort for them, but more so. And this is, this was, I said this in a, in a podcast not too long ago. For, because people ask me like how does how does what you're doing in your work impact what you're doing with your family mm -hmm. um, everything that I do I do with the aim of helping my children understand the art of the possible right you don't have to settle for a job you can do other things uh, you can be other things you can invent yourself you can invent something that's amazing but you got to be convicted and you got to work hard at it now um, um... I appreciate that a lot. Um, I want to touch on one point when you're going back and forth in email. Uh, one of the points that, uh, that you mentioned was just discussing some of the hardships of, of startup life. Yeah. And then also uh, you mentioned it, it's up to you if you want to go there, but you sent it over for the, for somebody in the family faced terminal illness while you were building yeah. out Julie. Um, yeah. You don't have to go into specifics. So as comfortable as you want, but I want to understand how you deal with that when Ooh. it's that's a tough topic and yeah yeah I look, love, it, yeah go go into it, it because i think that's it's important really tricky it, it's a tricky one to navigate right so uh let me rewind the clock so we took funding to the business in sort of the the first half of 2018 in the second half of 2018 my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer um Pancreatic cancer is, is awful. It's an evil, evil uh, disease. And I will say this. I think that there are two things that we all get to deal with in our life one, with our parents. One is dying, 
and the other one is death, right? Dying is way worse than death, mm -hmm. uh, the process, yeah. the journey. And so we'd watched my grandfather go through having pancreatic cancer uh, before, so it sounds like some sort of a family thing. It's actually, ironically, it's not. Uh, and my grandfather's brother went through it, and my grandfather's other brother's son went through it. So my dad started losing weight in September of 2018. He got pretty sick uh, in, in late, or so, sometime in October. Uh, I remember October 24th was the day that we got that diagnosis that dad had pancreatic cancer. And that hits you like a lead balloon pretty hard. Um, so my dad and I are pretty close. We, we, uh, we've been each other's golf buddies and all that stuff for, for a long time. So when that diagnosis came, it was like all hands on deck. We are dealing with this. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk about what that means to the business. And I'll talk to, to you what that means as, a, as an entrepreneur, uh, as you need to step away from the business. I had... Like it, it wasn't even a choice. It wasn't even a thought in my mind that I needed to step away from the business to deal with my dad's health. So we did, and uh, we were very, very lucky. So uh, let's see. Dad was operated on around November twenty second of twenty eighteen, and through twenty nineteen, we had a number of different incidents where he was like touch and go, really touch and go. The surgery to get rid of uh, a Adeno, adenocarcinoma, it, it, which is like really aggressive cancer, uh, is so invasive. Like they rip out organs and they build new organs out of your old organs to try to put you back together. It's like, I'm going to take all these five pieces, but we're, it's like taking out a structural beam in your house and somehow holding the roof up. Uh, so, you know, we, we, he had to go through a pretty, pretty gnarly surgery. He got like a 9% chance of five year survival on, on cancer uh, of this nature. This is not the one to get. So again, we were, I was really, really committed to getting my dad into the right surgeon, into the right hospital, into the right uh, care. And that was <laughs> frankly where my entrepreneurial spirit shone, you know, I'm a problem solver. And so, uh, uh, I've said this, uh, I said this at an event in December, I think, found my dad the best surgeon. I found my dad like the, all, all, all the things he needed to give himself a chance uh, through like a really good email. Like it just wrote like, here's the Hail Mary cold call email and it worked. Uh, got him in to, to the right surgeon and uh, he is, you know, for we're a year and a half removed from his surgery and he played his first round of golf about a month ago. Um, now he ain't the same guy, you know, he's, he's pretty beat up. He's 40 pounds later. He is, uh, you know, my dad was the guy that would say, like, Hey, bring your car over to my place. I'll change your brakes at 72. Right? Like, Oh, okay, here you go. And he'd, he'd jack the car up and rip the brakes out and put in new brakes. He's not that guy anymore. Now he's the guy that teaches me how to do it while he stands back. Um, but he's there and you know, that to me was the most important part. So from a business perspective, what you'll learn through that process is who your real leaders are and where your deficiencies are, because I did need to step away for considerable periods of time, uh, both mentally and physically spent, I'm guessing that, uh, I spent between 20 and 25% of my 2019 year bedside in the hospital uh, for like on different days. Right, just coaching and talking to dad, making sure that he had what he needed. Um, and so, yeah, you do you you understand who your leaders are through that process and that journey. Uh, and and that I think is the, the 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 silver lining for the business is yeah, we might have suffered from me not being around, but we also gained an opportunity to level up in certain parts of the business where we needed to. So um, that's and that's something that. I think a lot of uh, entrepreneur stories or entrepreneurs don't take into consideration. Um, just like the, that's a, obviously an extreme example. And I, you know, you, yeah. don't, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't going to have to experience that. Thank God. That's a very tough thing to go through. Yeah. But I still think that even for, yeah, it's tough, but entrepreneurs don't even think that, that I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of hype and a lot of, uh, a lot of, I don't know, glorification of becoming an entrepreneur, starting your own thing. Um, you started later on in your career after you had multiple successes and you're still, you know, dealing with things, uh, mm -hmm. that are difficult. So I guess, you know, what, 
outside of that, what are some other like sobering truths of, uh, so you mentioned time uh, and obviously being, and having to be able to balance like real life things that you can't just step away from the business. Mm-hmm. In some cases, you were fortunate you could and, and so yeah. But uh, what are some other like tough lessons for entrepreneurs that they, they may not hear enough? Things that you've had to go through uh, with Dooley or with, over your career? Yeah, look, I, I think we live in a really delicate era right now too, right? That we're not in the madman years of say whatever the hell you want and do whatever the hell you want. There are no repercussions for your actions. We're living in a moment in like literally a moment in time right now where the Black Lives Matter movement is finally getting some proper recognition. We're living in a moment where misogyny is unacceptable unless you're the president of the United States. So I'm saying that very candidly. Um, <laughs> uh, and there, there's all of these different things that are happening. Man, you're going to fuck up so much as, a, yeah. as an entrepreneur with the things you say and the things you do because the thing that makes you great about being an entrepreneur is pushing the edge and pushing the envelope and, and thinking radically different in many cases. Uh, sometimes that means you say things that are wrong and, and you do things that are maybe not, uh, that, that, that don't land right. Not just you, but people within your business. Yeah. You have to be really aware of that. Um, and so we, you will, you're going to make mistakes like that. I think that the biggest thing that you need to be aware of is that accountability is so, so, so important. Uh, and, and awareness is so, so, so important. You will say things, I look, I'm from a different generation uh, than the majority of my employees. I'm probably 15 plus years older than most of my team, uh, which means that I was brought up in a slightly different era where you said slightly different things and you got to be aware of that. Um, and you got to be aware of like where the world is going. So uh, that part is, I wouldn't call it hard, but it's certainly... It certainly requires you to be at the wheel of the, of the vehicle and not going on autopilot um, so that you can adjust when you yeah. need to adjust. Trim the sails if you want to use the, the sailing analogy. So that part, I think, is, is not a tough lesson, but an important one. Um, and, and everybody is going to make mistakes, right? Big or small, yeah. everybody's going to make some mistakes. Uh, and, and so you also have to <laughs> – you have to – really work with uh, your team on what the, what the road to recovery on any mistake might be as well. Um, so that, that I think is, is one that I'm pretty aware of. Uh, again, uh, one of the other things that, that I would say for any entrepreneur is fear can really hold you back. Fear of making that call to a customer that might reject you fear of trying something new, fear of going in a direction that seems like it's counter to the, the argument, but might be the right thing. Fear can really hold you back. Um, other lessons we, so we built, <laughs> this is more of like a go to market lesson. We built a product that users loved and their bosses thought was a nice to have. Thank God for the product led growth movement that's happening right now, like zoom and Calendly and expensify and all these different companies where users are becoming more and more empowered. Uh, but, you know, in the, in the very beginning of, of the business, we, we didn't understand how to convert that into a message that the market could consume and really help to get that buy-in. Um, so some go-to-market go challenges, you really under, have to understand, like, who your actual buyer is and how adoption is going to happen. Uh, I think it took us a while to figure those market motions out. And, you know, some people figure them out faster. Some people figure them out slower. Some people don't figure them out. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's certainly one that I would, would hold on to. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if this is a lesson, but it's a reality. You know, I was an EVP of sales at my previous company earning very good money. You're not going to earn very good money in the early days of your startup, right? And so you have to be willing to make that sacrifice, right? Like I think about the trips that we don't take right now because you know we're growing a business and how the whole team is on for the ride not just not just dad the kids are on for the ride my wife is on for the ride you got to think about how it impacts them as well uh, and really make sure that everybody has the appetite for that journey now i guess my question is as we Continue to develop all these tools. All these tools are meant for, you know, including Dually and other ones. They're meant for enablement. 
So they're meant to basically make things easier for sales reps and each tool is making things easier and the sales reps responsibilities and KPIs and, and what they're accountable for is, is ever increasing. Um, now, you know, this is partly due to technology, but also automation and other types of enablement tools that allow, allow sales reps to basically increase their personal effectiveness. And I guess the question is, what does the future of sales, what does the future of work, what do, what do all these things look like when we're continuously giving new technologies to increase the performance of, of these individuals, noting that they're still, they're still only human at the end of the day. So is there a limit to how effective we can make people? Is there a limit uh, psychologically to how effective we can make people? When, when is the cutoff point where, uh, where we can no longer increase the effectiveness or the efficacy of, of an individual with a tool? Yeah, I think so. Uh, like every single product that you bring on board will purport that it's going to improve your performance by 10%, yeah. right? So theoretically, at some point in time, you're, you're exceeding the limits of what's possible. This one's better. This one makes me 10% better. This one shaves off 10% of my time. So if you have, you know, you buy 20 products that each shave, shave 10% of your time off, theoretically, you're going back in time. Yeah. Uh, that's obviously not the case. So I think that what you're going to see in the future of work, and I'll talk more about the future of work, because I think future of work is actually a really interesting thing right now. Like mm -hmm. Bloomberg talks about it all the time, uh, and a number of, of other major uh, media companies are, are really engaged in this whole concept of the future of work. Future of work is letting people do the job that you told them that they were signing up for, right? So if you look at the definition of a salesperson, and you said, okay, what does a salesperson do? At its core, if you were to sum it up in five words or less, you would say a salesperson sells stuff, right? More or less. Now, that's not what a salesperson does. A salesperson forecasts. A salesperson does expense reports. A salesperson has one-on-ones with their manager. A salesperson takes notes in meetings. A salesperson updates the CRM and does all of this other stuff. But you don't talk about that, right? So the reality is I think that the future of work is that the definition of your job at its, at its simplest level is what you're actually going to be doing. And all of the technology that you surround the, the, the seller with or the, the worker with are going to solve the problems of the things that you didn't tell them were in their job description. Hmm. All right. That's an interesting way of thinking, but it makes a lot of sense because yeah. that's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah it's, I mean, I, Maybe it's oversimplified, but I think that the reality is, again, I'll go back to that initial example. When I signed Major League Baseball or in the NHL, nobody came up to me and said, high five, Chris, really good job on signing those deals. Did you update the competitor field in Salesforce? Did you file your expenses for that trip? Nobody said that, right? It, it's, it's assumed that you're going to do those things. But as a seller, it's assumed that because my paycheck is so predicated on my performance, that I'm not going to do those things, right? Like, I'm, I'm really not. 50% of a sales, salesperson's paycheck, 50% plus, actually, if you're a good seller, is based on your performance. It's an open-ended pay, uh, paying role, right? You can make as much money as humanly possible within that job, unless you have a capped commission plan, which I think are terrible. Um, so if that's the case, you're hiring somebody that you know is under the pump to perform. No other role in the business, engineering, HR, nobody else has quotas that if they miss them, their paycheck gets cut in half. You might miss your bonus, but your bonus is probably not going to cut your pay in half. It's probably incremental. That's why it's called a bonus, right? Commission is not a bonus. It is your pay. Uh, so when you're thinking along the lines of that, you have to really be empathetic to the needs of that person. The future of work is the ability for us to deliver on the, the promises of what your job is supposed to be and getting rid of like all the block and tackle crap that get people all tied up in their, in their daily chores and activities. So that's why like you look at all of the revolutions that are happening around the world. It's all about trying to improve the perception of, a specific thing that's happening, right? Perception of women, the perception of, yeah. of black people, the perception of this, perception of that. Even in the perce your perception of work, and I don't want to compare the two because they're not even close to the same thing. In the, in the perception of your job, 
you never signed up for all the other crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we want to get to a point where we give them an empathetic solution. And if you don't provide them with an empathetic solution, they will find it. And it might not be at your company. That's a, that's a very good takeaway for, for, <laughs> for anyone listening. And I think that that's why we see such high turnover rates. Um, 25% in sales. Yeah. Some of it's, you know, unregretted. Some of it's because somebody doesn't, doesn't have a passion. I, I, cr I crushed my number at an antivirus company um, one year, sort of between vision critical and my last entrepreneurial role, uh, where I figured I wanted to get into SaaS. I hated my job. And I left because I hated selling antivirus software. Some people would be like, security software? Sign me up. This is really cool. I was like, screw that. Uh, again, you got to kind of align with passion too. So 25% of people churn year over year, unregretted, regretted, misfit. Um, now, just to tee it up, I want to, uh, first of all, I just want to ask, is there anything um, outside of, you know, what we talked about um, in, in your journey, in your life, before Dooley or, or at Dooley, that we didn't cover because if if we're teed up for that then i want to ask sort of closing questions just uh lessons learned from your career but uh, just the floor for you to before we go and yeah move. i would say the only other thing like there, there is one lesson that i really uh try to bring into my job which i learned as a baseball coach um and look you, you sure there's tons of stuff that, that we don't know but let's talk about this one specifically I remember I had this, this kid on my baseball team a few years ago uh, and I had just gone through this, this coaching program to learn how to be a better coach. I still think I'm an okay coach. I don't think I'm a great coach. I'm certainly not going to coach at the major league level anytime soon. Um, but uh, this, this kid was so self-aware uh, that it was like wild to experience this. Uh, I was trying to teach him how to do his swing and I was teaching him wrong. Uh, and, and this kind of goes into the whole idea of enablement, right? And, and he, he paused and he goes, coach, I don't learn the way you're teaching me. I'm, I'm a, I'm a hands-on learner. I need to have the bat in my hand in order to learn. You're trying to teach me like a visual learning. So there's actually three types of learners. There's people who are, are tactile, people that learn through hearing, uh, and then people who learn through seeing. And, uh, he was very much a tactile learner. And so I'm like, okay, <laughs> holy crap. I didn't even realize that I was making a mistake. Here's the bat. All right, let's break it down into smaller bits. Let's put you in your backswing. Okay. Elbow in the right position, hands in the right position, hands up by the ear, all that kind of stuff. Now, now you need to go to here. Now you need to go to here. Now you need to go to here. And as soon as we did that, he, like his game changed. He was a kid who couldn't swing a baseball bat who went on to be, uh, what it, there was a, an award that he was nominated for uh, at the end of the year for like basically most improved player, the kid who gave his heart and soul into the game. And it was like this moment of great pride for me. But again, I think what I learned from that is you, the way that you learn isn't the way that everybody else learns. So you need to be really sensitive to that when you're delivering um, training or material to other people. And we think about that again, from an empathetic perspective, we think about that inside of our product, like how and when is it appropriate to educate you? That's a, that is, a, that is a very good lesson. And I think that, um, when, when you are looking to coach or train or even build a product like that has to be something that has to be taken into consideration as well. Mm. And I don't think enough people do, um, the, the whole, that's a whole other conversation, not just on, on building the best possible user experience for a product, but the, the way to coach people is a whole other conversation that I have a, a lot of issues when it comes to sales. I feel that not a lot of um, people coach sales individuals properly either. Mm. Uh, but a lot of it is, again, because of, we touched on this at one point, it was just the, the person who usually defaults into like a, a leadership position and doesn't know, um, you know, the, the best way to coach or train or onboard. Yep. And then you get that rocky period in that person's onboarding. A lot of it is because, uh, it's usually just the best person in that role that yep. moves into the next role. Right. And that's not a good fix either. There's probably one other thing that, that is interesting as an entrepreneur uh, and somebody who likes to be hands on and, and, and whatnot. Uh, you need to have a bit more patience than I think most entrepreneurs do with the, the people who are learning that don't know it as well as you do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I see it even with the way I work with my kids. It's like, Oh, I could let you cut that onion, but I, this is my lesson from last night. 
they let you cut that onion, but I'm going to do it way faster and way easier. So I'm just going to do it. And my kid's like, but I want to learn. It's like, okay. You got, so the art of letting go is, is I think important and realizing that despite the fact that you probably are better at it out of the gate, uh, you can let people get better than you at it if you give them enough opportunity and you need to make sure that you are aware of that. And I would say that that's an ongoing lesson for me. Uh, the art of letting go is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's your baby, when it's your thing, uh, when you know that there's an easier way of doing things, that's, that's a tricky one. Very good. Um, okay. So to, to close this up, rapid fire, two questions, uh, yeah. that I like to ask. The first question is one life lesson that you would tell your younger self. One life lesson that I would tell my younger self, uh, oh gosh, that's an interesting one. Um, you gave a lot of stuff, so I feel guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, give, I'll give you one that, that is actually a quote that I really like. Fearlessly okay. be yourself. Fearlessly be yourself. Uh, don't hold back because you're worried about how other people think about you or perceive what you're doing. Um, and I, I commend my eldest for this, where he doesn't necessarily want to go, go with the crowd all of the time, and he's very comfortable in his own skin. Uh, my wife is actually very comfortable in her own skin as well. And from time to time, I get uncomfortable in my own skin. It's okay to be uncomfortable. But being yourself is the most authentic thing that you can do and often really hard. Uh, and the sooner you can figure that out, the happier you're going to be in your life. That's a good, that's a good life lesson. I, I like that a lot. Um, second question, uh, what's a resource? It could be a book, podcast, audible, something, or it could be a person too. Something that uh, you would recommend people go check out and that you have learned from. Oh, there's lots of those as well. Um, one or two, one or, one or two. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll give you, I'll give you a couple. Um, one book that I'm, I'm really in love with right now from a sales perspective is called the transparency cell. The transparency cell is, is a really, really strong uh, read. And it actually, it really talks to being empathetic, but also helping your, your buyer understand your position better because buyers don't understand how, how you sell or what's important to you all the time. So it just lays out a bit of a different framework. Um, and that's by a gentleman by the name of Todd Capone. So Todd, there's your plug. Uh, and I just enjoyed the read. He's, he's a, a really just genuine individual. Um, let's see what, there are other resources that I think that you should definitely tap into. Uh, but the, the biggest thing for me is, you know, you got to dive into understanding other, if you're an entrepreneur, you got to dive into understanding the other roles within your business. Um, uh, and I don't know if there's a, a brilliant resource for this, but I would be reading like Bill Gates's biography and things like that to, to just figure out how somebody became so well-rounded uh, at other parts and understanding other roles within, within their lives. I, I'm a huge biography consumer. Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, all those ones, they're all fascinating. Very good. Um, and, and last, uh, where do people go to connect with you? If they want to go learn more about Dooley, uh, you know, LinkedIn, what's the best place? Yeah. Uh, www.dooley.ai, D O O L Y.ai is how you'll see, uh, what we're building a real empathy driven approach to make you insanely productive as a salesperson. Um, and uh, if you want to reach me personally, I'm more than happy to, to chat with anybody about anything that is uh, around what we do or around what you do. Uh, it's Chris, K-R-I-S, at Dooley.ai. That's all for today. Thanks again for joining me on another episode of the Success Story Podcast. You can download or stream this podcast wherever podcasts are available, including iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and many others. You can also watch this podcast on YouTube. If you haven't already, please subscribe and share this podcast with your friends, family, coworkers, and peers. Please leave us a rating on iTunes. It takes about 30 seconds as it allows other people to find our podcast and lets our amazing guests reach even more people with their message. And remember, any rating is fine as long as it contains five stars. I'm Scott Clary from the Success Story Podcast, signing off.